Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Jesus name you can be seated father. We thank you today We thank you for your presence Oh in his presence is fullness of joy Oh right now where you're sitting. I don't care what you've been through just right now. His presence is in this place Oh, let the Lord minister to you right now where you're at You don't have to wait to go any further. You don't have to wait for something to happen next week right now in Jesus name the Lord can begin to break stuff off your life if you believe that say amen He can break stuff off your life today is going to be a different day Different than any other day. Oh, you might have come thinking today was going to be like last week or four months or two years ago Today's a different day and we can declare as we do every day Today is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it hallelujah well we are currently going through the book of john and we're finishing chapter four today and going to be good getting into some of chapter five and i do want to say thanks to all the our amazing team leaders and volunteers for all the amount of ministry that's come out of the church this week amen we had over 600 people here on Friday, and God moved in people's lives. Yesterday, we fed how many? Over 120 people yesterday. God's doing my... Let me tell you something. You can't go wrong. Never. The church is called to not only preach the gospel, but the church is called to be a light. And, and when you... All the stuff we're doing, we're just trying to be a light to this city in Jesus' name. Amen. I know Thanksgiving's coming up, and, uh, you know, that's uh, always a good time to buy a treadmill. And, uh, you know, maybe just after lunch, go down and walk on a little bit and uh, come back up. You know, I, you know, here's the thing. Don't try to lose weight. Just stay where you're at in Jesus' name. You know, just eat a little bit and walk. That's a, just pray about that. But anyway, John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54 and I'm going to be reading quite a bit of scripture before I get into uh, what I'm preaching today. But it's going to be based off these two sections of scripture. It says, Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. There's a sermon there. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Canaan of Galilee where he uh, had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, see, he already, he heard something about Jesus. If you hear something that, hey, this guy's healing people and your son's dying, you're going to find the guy. Say, I'm going to find the guy. This isn't any other guy. This is, this is the master of the sea, the healer, the redeemer. He, he didn't know all going on, but I got to find him. So when he heard, see, here's the thing. Before you find Jesus, you first hear something about Jesus. He heard something about Jesus. That's why your testimony is so important that during the week you share things with people about what God's doing in your life. All of a sudden they show up because they heard something about Jesus. And what they heard, they want to experience in their own life. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. It's amazing how you'll start coming to church when you, something's at the point of death. Amazing how you'll start seeking something but yourself when you've run out of all the answers in yourself. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people, he kind of, this is a little rebuke here, See signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The old man said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. It's like he ignored the little quote, Jesus, just come heal my son. Jesus said to him, just go to your house, your son lives. He didn't have to get a bunch of prayer warriors. He didn't have to fast for 40 days. He just said, right, go on home, your son lives. 
at the word of Jesus. See, a lot of times we think we got to do all this work and we don't realize we're focused more on our work than his power. All he has to say is go and live and you'll live in Jesus' name. Now, notice what the man did. Are you sure? No, he didn't say that. I, I, I mean, really? I don't want to waste my time going back home and my son be dead. No, the man said, so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. Didn't try to get no autograph. Didn't try to sit down and say, can we go to dinner? Can we go to lunch? He just said he went his way and believed what Jesus said. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour. See, here's the thing. He wanted to investigate what Jesus said. What time did Jesus say it? And if, was it at that time that Jesus said it that his son lived? See, see, the devil, any time a miracle comes to your life and God's performing a miracle in your life, the devil will want you to analyze the miracle and think, is this really just coincidence or is this the power of God? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His servants met him and told him, your son lives, and he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. See, this is the problem when people quit believing in healing power of and, and, and quit believing in the healing power of Christ and, and miracles. Really, they're, they're, they're distancing themselves. The Lord uses these things to show people that God is God. It's a sign for the unbeliever. This, again, is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. It's the first section of Scripture. We're going to read 15 more verses, if that's okay. This might be the most Bible you've read all year. Yeah. Let me tell you something about reading the Word. Some people say, well, I read 10 chapters today. What'd you learn? It'd be better for you to meditate on a few scriptures and get a revelation on them than just brag that you read 10 and don't know nothing. You know what I'm saying? John chapter 5, verse 1 through 15. Here we go. We're getting to chapter 5. This is the, see, the first one we were reading about the, 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 the healing of the official son. This is the healing of, uh, at the pool of Bethesda. And I preached a sermon on this, I believe, a month and a half, two months ago. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is, in, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind and lame and paralyzed, waiting for the water to move. Now, you got to understand, they got into some mystical stuff here, right? Don't be getting into some mystical stuff. A lot of believers getting into some mystical stuff. A lot of believers getting into some suspicious stuff. Ah, oh, stay out of the land of suspicion. That's the devil's territory. The Bible says, cast down all thoughts, imaginations, Theories, anything exalts itself against the knowledge of God, stay out of that stuff. Stay out of the Enneagrams and numerologies and new age and, and stars and they line in and getting your horoscope. That's of the devil. You don't need to know the stars. You just need to know the one who made the stars. Hey, hallelujah. Woo. Now, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. That don't sound like God. God heals all. Go back to the Old Testament. God healed them all. It wasn't a contest. Who can get in first? That's like some devil stuff. Like, ooh, you know. You know, you know who's going to get in here first? Now, I preached a message on this, so I'm not going to really break this down as I am something else here in just one minute. But it said, uh, after the stirring of the water uh, was made uh, well of whatever disease they had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity of 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, this is the question, and this is the question that Jesus has for you today. Do you want to be made well? See, this is an interesting question because a lot of times we'll go around 
trying to start a pity party, telling everybody what's going wrong in our life, but we don't want to be made well. Because if we were to be made well, we wouldn't have a story in reverse to get the pity from the story we were telling. People love the attention. Do you want to be made well? That's the thing. Do you want to be blessed? The other night you were saying you used to be on food stamps. Well, do you want to get off food stamps? Well, you see what I'm saying? Jesus will tell you stuff. Do you want to get off food stamps? That means that I want to be blessed. God needs to be your only source. He the one. The sick man answered and said, Sir, that's how a lot of us are. I have nobody to put me in the pool when the water stirred up. That's not what Jesus asked. Don't change the subject. He said, do you want to be made well? He didn't ask you why you aren't well or you don't have anybody to help you get well. Do you want to be well? Now, 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 now. I have no man put me in the pool when the water stirred, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Excuses. Excuses. Excuses is the barrier to miracles. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now here comes the, the Pharisees. You'll see him and those will see them in a minute. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. Oh, these religious dogs. Dogs. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them and said, Who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who's the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was. Come on now. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Both stories focus on the healing power of God. Both stories focus on our reaction to the gospel. Both stories show us that healing happens when you're willing to be a participator. Meaning God can't do anything if you have no faith to work with. No, no, no. And God don't do something for you because he feels sorry for you. No, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But those that come to him must believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And I'm going to say this, that the greatest barrier to the faith that you're needing in regards to healing or anything else is the uncertainty of God's will. I've never met more people in my life today that are uncertain in what God wants to do. And it's almost like we've put down the word and we've put up people who are commentating the word. And it's like we're following people who twist the word. And we don't know it's twisted because we didn't first know the original word. You hear what I'm saying? I know it's cold outside, but it's hot in here. Uh, I don't, we, we had to put the air on. <laughs> but they'll twist it. Now, 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 the healing power of God cannot flow in someone who is uncertain of God's will on the matter of healing. Now, here's the thing. You might be sitting here today and be like, oh, I'm fine. I'll, you, hey, the devil will try to attack your body. He'll try to attack your kids. And the problem is we don't have an ingrain, a revelation on the inside of us. So when the storm comes, we go looking for pieces of paper and articles, but you can put it on the inside of you and be ready to go the moment that the enemy tries to attack. But you need to know this because there's a lot of people 
that they start their prayers, and I've said this for years, they start their prayers like, Lord, if it be your will. That's the dumbest way to pray. You should know God's will. It's a covenant. Like people are like, God, if it's your will to heal Billy, heal him. You don't know God's word. It's always God's will to heal. There was never one single time that Jesus encountered a sick person and they weren't made well. And the Bible says, as Jesus was, so are we. And if Jesus said, greater things shall you do, what are we doing here? And then you have these, some people that say, well, healing only worked for like three and a half years. So God used up all this power in Jesus and then he, 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 he was on reserve. And, you know, the Acts of the Apostles, you know, the book of Acts, it should really be called the Acts of the Holy Ghost. Because it was the Holy Ghost moving through the entire book. And what Jesus did, the same spirit that lived in Jesus lives in you. So why do we limit ourselves? Well, we limit ourselves because we are uncertain of his will. The power of God can only be claimed where the will of God is known. That's why so many powerless people, they can't claim the power because they don't know the power. They don't know his will. For example, it would be impossible, I would think everybody here would agree with this, it would be impossible to get a sinner to believe unto righteousness before they had been fully convinced that it was God's will to save them. No one is like, well, I really don't know. If, if you question whether or not it's God's will to save you, you'll never seek salvation. You'll have uncertainty. Faith is 100% assurance. Now, that bothers some people. It's not 90%. It's not 80%. It's not 60%. It's 100% assurance that what God said, he'll do. And if God has spoken a word, we read through his word. See, I'm, I don't know. It's taken time. You know, sometimes we, we, we get into a wrong place because we, we're, we're, we're in like a gulf between believing and the manifestation of what we're believing. And I'll get into that here in a minute, but I just, I, I need you to know that, that faith must rest on the will of God alone. Not our desires, not our wishes, but faith, listen to me, is not believing that God can. That's not faith. Faith is not believing that God can. Faith is believing that God will. I want to say that again. Faith is not believing that God can. Faith is believing that God will. I'm going to say it again. Because I know God can. That's not faith. Faith is believing God will. You can believe God can do something but not have the faith to believe he will do something for you. Say it again. Faith is not believing God can. Because obviously, he created the universe, created the stars, created the galaxies. It's amazing, Ramsey, how we believe that God created the atmosphere, but he can't help us with cancer and the reason is more people are in tune to their cancer sign somebody the other day asked me what sign are you I said and I, I didn't know I really I don't I don't know what sign I am I don't care all I know is I'm called to walk in signs wonders and miracles Jesus said, you got to stay out of that stuff, man. You got to stay out of that stuff. Stay out of the demonic stuff. Don't go looking for the devil because believe me, he's a showman. He will love. No, no, no. Now, and I've said this and I just felt the Holy Spirit had me say it again, that, that, that to say healing, and this is the thing, I'm going to pray for anybody who's sick today. Doesn't matter what it is, I'm going to pray for you. Lay my hands on you. I believe in the power of laying on of hands. It, it's sad that so many churches preach, but there's no demonstration. It's like, here we had a nice word, but we never see the word actually practiced in front of us. Right? Jesus always preached and there was a demonstration. Hallelujah. 
But I got to tell you this, that, that, that to say healing doesn't belong to us, and I've said this before, is to say that God's changed from I am to I was. But that's really what we're saying. That, you know, the great I am is now the great I was. You know, I am your healer. Now, I, I was your healer, but you can rest assured that God has not changed his name. He is still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jesus has never abandoned his office of healer. He is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Say amen to that. See, see, we, we see throughout the Gospels, read the Bible, man. Read the Word. Get off Netflix and get in the Word. Stop watching documentaries about the Word and get in the Word. I don't want to see National Geographic tell me about the Word of God. You know? See throughout the Gospels that in bringing the sick to Christ for healing, it was repeatedly stated that they brought them all. We don't do that today. We bring the easy ones. Yeah. Yeah. But it don't matter if you got a bad neck or a bad back or cancer, diabetes. Doesn't matter what your condition may be. I've seen over the years God destroy about every known element I can think of in people's bodies that was trying to destroy them. Hallelujah. I've seen it time. You've seen it time and time again. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the people we see in scriptures, they brought the sick into the streets. See, I wonder if we actually had enough faith to bring them into the streets. You see, would we do that or we'd be like, well, you know, if they don't get healed, they're going to be mad at me. Bring them out into the streets and the couches. There, there, there came also multitudes out of the city round about Jerusalem. They brought all the sick folks and it says every single time, whether it's in the Gospels or in the book of Acts, all were healed. The maimed were healed. You know what that means? I don't got no arm and now I got an arm. Hallelujah. See, the, it was, it, the, the, the Holy Ghost was moving, was moving, and it wants to move again today in Jesus' name. Now, the Holy Spirit came to execute for us all the blessings purchased by Christ's redemption. This is so powerful to understand because when you have the Holy Spirit and you're in, when you're in relationship with the Holy Spirit, he will execute all the blessings that Christ purchased for you through his redemption. Now, this is where many times we get into trouble is we start putting more stock into our senses than we do the word of God. You know, with stuff going on in my life, I shouldn't be sane. You know, have you ever felt like that? Like, man, see, here's the thing. I've realized the Lord said, why are you looking to be messed up? The Lord ever just kind of kicked you, right? You know, just bam. Oh, oh, Lord. Why are you looking to be messed up? Why are you looking to be sad? Why are you looking to have a breakdown? See, why are you looking for the symptom that the world has? You don't have what the world has. You got Jesus. They don't got Jesus. There's two children in the world. There's children of the Lord and children of the devil. Well, I believe we're all children of the Lord. Then you don't believe the Bible. You've been going to a sugar church. You know, I, hey, seriously, it, it, Jesus called the Pharisees sons of hell. Paul called Alexander the coppersmith a child of the devil. 
You, all, you do not become a child of God until you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you are brought into the family of God. That's why you got all these coexist bumper stickers out there. God don't coexist with false gods. No. I'll be honest, every time I see one, I'm like, oh, man, my gas. But I, I just say, no, no. No, no. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. Hallelujah. See, if the bumper sticker makes you mad, you need to check your fruit. They put them on a cross. It was, you know, you know what I mean? Get into that later. But no person who allows his mind to be ruled by his senses can have victorious faith. No person, I don't care who you are. Why do we put so much stock in intelligence? Well, I'm smart. I, you know, I want my head good. I want my kids to make good grades and be smart, but not at the expense of, you see what I'm saying, of not knowing the Lord. And no person who allows his or her mind to be ruled by their senses can have victorious faith. The, the mind that is ruled by the senses, I'm talking touch, smell, see, hear, taste, lives in a realm of uncertainty. If you're going by what you're seeing and hearing and feeling, you're going to always have uncertainty. And until God's word gains mastery over your mind, your mind will be swayed by feelings and by what things you see or hear rather than by the word of God. See, this is the thing. We are in a new age environment. When I say we are, not you are, but the church is kind of like moving towards a new age kind of thinking. And they're calling it like hyper supernatural stuff. But they're getting into demonic things. Super spiritualizing things. And so what happens is in this new age, I, I haven't read this. I'm just saying this today out of my spirit, right? So go with me today. That it's like what used to be discernment through the Holy Spirit is now the discernment through a false spirit. And the false spirit, the discernment is by what is seen and heard and felt and touched. So now we are calling biblical discernment when it's not biblical discernment, it is emotional discernment. Yeah. I've never thought about that to just now. But I'm here to tell you, you got to watch out for that kind of stuff in your life. Because, you know, you, you, you youngsters know that there are people, they, they'll, they find a devil in everything. I mean, he's at quick trip behind the Slurpee machine. It's red, the devil red, hell, I'll tell. I'm not going to get red Slurpee. I need purple. I need royal. You know, they get, get, get all messed up. And so you got a people that it's like they can't even, oh, ooh, they can't even function. The devil has literally overtaken them. They're calling it being moved by the spirit. Deception. Here's the thing about deception. Have you ever heard someone who was deceived actually admit they were deceived? Well, no, because then they wouldn't have been deceived. Right? That is why the word of God is the compass. That is why the only way I can make sure I'm not deceived is by the word of God following it every single day, not getting off into some kind of that sounds good kind of teaching. See, the Bible says they have itching ears. They, they want to hear stuff that makes them sound. Here's what they want. They want to find preaching that will comfort the demonic spirit that's tormenting them. Now, now, moving on. I just think it's important to understand that because your mind 
if you don't get authority and you, and because here's the thing, people, when I was growing up, they'd have these like stronghold, we're going to cast down strongholds over the city. That's not biblical. Do you ever find Paul casting down strongholds over the city? Do you ever find like them protesting when they started killing a bunch of the Christians? No, what did they do? Every time something bad happened, they just got together and had a praise party. That's what they did every single time. Strongholds, the Bible says, casting down imaginations, theories, reasonings, pulling down strongholds, right? You are responsible to pulling down the strongholds. I talked a little bit about this last week in your life. You, your mama can't pull it down for you. These strongholds, they start in your mind, right? They start in your mind, and if you let them get root in your mind, your reasoning, your theories, your imagination. See, when sin is full grown, it leads to death. And it all starts with the imagination. That is why you have to be careful. The Bible says, test all spirits. Because there's people that have come in, you thought, oh, this is a godly spirit. It's a demonic spirit. Anytime a spirit shows up and there's confusion, it's a demonic spirit. God is the author of peace, not confusion. Know these things in your life. I'm telling you these things because they're connected to the subject of healing. So the mind that's ruled by the senses, it lives in a realm of uncertainty. And, then, and until God's word gains mastery over your mind, your mind be swayed by feelings, by things you see here rather than by the word of God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something about deliverance. Is this okay? I don't know where the church went wrong and started getting into some weird stuff with deliverance. Now, there are people who are demon possessed. And there are people who, you know, you could use the word, they're oppressed by the enemy. Um, and usually a, a demon possessed person, you will see manifestation of that demon. Like I've seen, I've walked past people and they just start sticking their tongue at me. <sighs> and like, well, they're probably demon possessed because the spirit that's in me is agitating the spirit that's in them. Now, now I'll tell you that you need to be careful because see deliverance a lot of times after people are saved, they, they no longer seek deliverance. Because you've been delivered out of darkness into his marvelous light. But there are times that believers can get into things. They open the door to the devil. They open up their mind. They open up their life. And you need to seek deliverance. And what I mean by seeking deliverance is all you need to do. See, it's not hard. Lord, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. I close that door in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm sorry I shouldn't have opened that, and I close every, every door that the enemy's tried to come through. Lord, I thank you right now that I'm delivered from that thing in Jesus' name, that my mind is sound. Hallelujah. That's, hey, that'd be a good prayer for if, if you're bound by pornography. That'd be a good prayer if, you, you know what I mean, if you're tormented in your mind, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Jesus. There were no 12-step classes in Jesus' day, just the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Nothing wrong with 12-step classes, I'm just saying. Put more stock in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Now, I got to keep moving. I know the game's not till 7. I'm going to try to get around 6.30 tonight. <laughs> I, I get Who do they play tonight? Chargers. St. Louis. Who? L.A. Did, didn't they used to be in St. Louis? 
Rams, oh, they're all the same. They, they, Browns still don't have a logo, you know. You might need to pray about that, you know. I don't know. Might be pray about that. No logo. No logo. Somebody was just lazy and said, just paint the helmet brown. Anyway, here we go. Can I go, can I, can I be funny real quick and tell you this? Is, I was talking to Toby and Tommy the other day about this. They, you know, they, they, they made all these teams change their names. Now, I'm Cherokee Indian. Now, I found out Toby, uh, you, uh, Native American. But, but my, you know, uh, your dad's mom was almost 100% Cherokee. And the leader of Cherokee Nation came to her funeral. But I was just saying, but we've had all these teams change their name, Cleveland Indians. But you still got Tomahawk cruise missiles. Apache helicopters. You know what I mean? Have you ever thought about that? The government's like, you guys need to change these names, but we're going to keep our, you know. I don't know. You might just think about that sometime, you know. Try to think, you know, a little bit. Hallelujah. I got to move on. But let me tell you this. The mind... And the thoughts that you have, if you're seeking healing or anything else, they have to be renewed. They got to be brought into harmony with the mind of God as revealed in the Bible. And I want to say this, faith for God's promised blessing is the result of knowing and acting on the word of God. That might sound simple to you, but that's, that's how it's done. If you have no action, you have no faith. Faith without works is dead. A lot of people say, I believe. Well, what, how do I know you believe? Right? You can say it. Everybody can say, I believe, I believe, I believe. But see, true faith is putting, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning that I know it's my promise. I know it belongs to me. I know I don't currently see it, but faith will materialize it to coming into my life. Yeah. And here's the simple truth. If you will continue to believe that God gave you what you asked for when you prayed, thanking him and praising him, it will always materialize. And so many are waiting for God to heal them when God's waiting for them to take what he's already purchased for them. And time really kills people's faith. Sometimes, boom, you just, I've prayed for my kids, boom. And then sometimes it's like a day. But no matter if it's a day, a month, I just keep saying, hey, I tell my kids all the time, you might not feel it working, but I'm here to tell you he ain't a liar. And if he promised it, it's coming in Jesus' name. See, what happens is, is we will, we'll, we'll walk in the Word for about five minutes and all of a sudden, it don't work. It don't work. You told me you're going to heal me. It don't work. I know I ate four quarter pounders with cheese. My stomach's burning. God, help me, please. <laughs> it's amazing. We'll give the devil 20 years and God two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, I feel some freedom in the house today. This is, this is so, I'll tell you, in order to have the Spirit of God move, you got to have freedom. You don't want to be a church that's fighting hindrances. You want to be a church that's fighting against the thing that's trying to destroy people's lives you see what I mean? So healing today, I, I, I'm telling you, I want you, as I'm preaching this, no matter who you are in here, I want you to fully expect that God is even touching your body now in Jesus' name. Touching your body now in Jesus' name. You might have just got a bad report from the doctor. This might be the first time you've ever even heard a message on the subject of healing. But I'll let you know that I don't care what you've heard. Jesus will make good on his word every single day. See, see, Jesus commands 
us to believe that we received the things we pray at the time we pray. Notice that Jesus commands us to believe that we have received the things we pray for at the time we pray and before they take it visible form. See, you want to have the faith when something becomes visible, then that's no longer faith. I'm going to work it out for you. I'm going to work it out for you. It's clear we see in Scripture that they exist in two forms. You first have the invisible and then afterward the visible. See, first, believe that ye have received them, that's the invisible form, and ye shall have them, that's the visible or material form. So we have them first in the realm of faith, afterwards in the sense realm. This is why Jesus in Mark eleven twenty four 24 commands us as soon as we pray to believe that we have received in its invisible form what we pray for, he then changes it into its visible or material form. The devil tries to destroy your life and your faith as something is in the invisible before it becomes in the visible. And we give up. That's why the Bible says after you've done everything you can to stand on the word, stand thereof. Stand therefore. I talked about it last week. Keep standing in Jesus' name. Keep standing. And you know, the entire 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews records the actions of God's saints in the faith realm before the result of their faith took visible form. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Walking by faith. Why am I saying this? If you want to experience healing, you got to know something about faith. You got to know something about faith. Faith. Walking by faith, walking by faith is walking by the kind of sight that sees and is occupied with eternal things. It, 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 it sees God, it sees his promises, it sees his faithfulness. That's walking by faith. When everybody told me we weren't going to get this building, I knew by faith that it was mine. I knew that every 50, all 50 banks denied me. I knew it was mine. To the place to I convinced my realtor, one day I said, you know that building's mine. He goes, oh, oh, yes, yes, uh, I know. <laughs> I don't care what anybody said. It might have been the fourth quarter. It might have seemed like overtime. I'm telling you, I don't look at a game where I'm losing. I'm on the winning side, and you're on the winning side today. Yeah. See, that's the thing. I don't know about you. But I believe God will do what he said he will do. I believe it. I believe it. I believe God will do what he said he will. There is no reason. There is no evidence in why you should ever doubt God for one moment. If you are going to doubt something, you need to doubt your own doubts. Because they're unreliable. Never doubt God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. See, I, I know I, I read two big passages on the subject of healing, and the Lord just said, you know, read these scriptures on healing, but then teach the people faith so they can receive the promise that they saw received in those scriptures. I've said this story, Jen, too many times. But I have to tell it again. There was an old mama. Had a four-year-old boy. The doctor said wouldn't, wouldn't live a few days. And boy had 26 diseases. Had no feet. Blind. Deaf. Missing some major organs messed up in his body and uh, she heard about a man named A.A. A. Allen and decided to go to this tent revival meeting uh, I believe it, it was in Tennessee and she brought the, the child to the meeting she didn't have any really money. And on the fourth night, 
the card back then, there were thousands of people. They'd fill out cards and, you know, people would pray for them. Brother Allen hadn't brought up this boy. And A.A. A. Allen's assistant, R.W. Shambach, she found him outside after a meeting and said, Brother Shambach, can you get Brother Allen to pray for my boy? He said, well, honey, if, if, she, if he don't pray for your boy tonight, I'll bring you back to his trailer and he'll pray for you after service. She said, because she said, this is it. This is my last night. She said, I only have $20 left to get home. Amen. This is documented. This was in the newspaper. I can send you all the, the, the official articles of this story. Because what I'm about to tell you, even though there's a lot of Pharisees who stood in front of Jesus and didn't believe what they saw, there's still people today who don't believe the healing power of God even when they see it. They believe a, a magic show in Branson, but they don't believe in the power of God. <laughs> More people with David Blaine getting intrigued about sitting in a box. Jesus will get you out of that box in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know the little trick where they do elevate? Jesus walked on water. He didn't need camera angles to walk on the water. Hallelujah. So, she had $20 left. Now, I'm going to tell you something because this is back in the, the 50s. Brother, Brother Allen went up to the stage that night in the tent, and he, Brother Shambach said he had never done this before. And he said, I want us to give a sacrificial offering tonight if you're needing a miracle. Never done this before. All of a sudden, R.W. Shambach sees that woman come down the aisle and put something in the bucket. Now, you got to remember, she was out of gas. She only had 20 bucks left. She didn't know how she was going to get home. Brother Shambach said, I had to run up there and see what she put in that bucket. And what she saw was a $20 bill in that bucket. Gave all that she had. All of a sudden, Brother Allen closed his eyes. I see, I see, I see. A car coming over Kentucky lines. Wait a minute. I see a child in a hospital started just rattling with 26 major diseases. Started naming them off. Started talking about seeing the baby in the ward and the doctors around it. Started seeing this dark figure, demonic, putting thorns in this child. It's a long story, but all I'm trying to tell you is he was up on stage and he said, is that boy here tonight? And that mama lifted up her boy and said, that's my boy. Brother, Brother Allen grabbed that boy. No feet, tongue hanging down to his chin, muscles all disfigured. Never spoke a word in his life. His eyes were all milky because he was blind. He was, he was deaf. And Brother Allen said, I, I want everybody to close their eyes right now. We're going to pray. And Brother Shambach said, I'm not closing my eyes for this one. <laughs> he said, when the man of God laid his hands on that boy, you heard the biggest, loudest pop, that tongue popped back up into his mouth. R.W. Shambach said feet began to form on that boy's leg. All the, the milky color in his eyes became blue. He could hear. All of a sudden, he puts the boy down on the ground. He runs towards his mama and says, Mama! At the same time, all the people that were brought in stretchers and wheelchairs, they said like an army, stood up at once and started walking towards the stage. I'm here to tell you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. There is a promise and it is yours for the taking. I tell you, I tell you, See, it's amazing 
that sometimes we hear stories and then our mind gets into a critical mode. But when we hear news of the devil, we don't get critical. Now, I'm telling you that to stir your faith. From people with Parkinson's to cancer and diabetes being healed in this house. I've seen deaf people, blind people. I've seen people, the doctor said two more months, and they've been alive for six years. Let God be true, every man a liar. Oh, hallelujah. I just have to tell you this. For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. This verse is carrying the idea of a declaration assuring the one will do what he or said they would do. I tell you, we know that all of God's promises are sure because Hebrews 6, 18 tells us that God cannot lie. God doesn't say one thing and mean another. Your friends might, but God doesn't. Psalms 138, 2 tells us that God has magnified his word even above himself. See, I want to stir you up this morning because 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56 says, not one word has failed of all the promises that he's given. Shut your mind off. Let the Holy Spirit rule and dominate you. See, there's something about believing God that will cause God to pass over a million people and get to you. There's something about praying in the Holy Ghost. There's something about believing God and, and he'll pass over a million. Ah, oh, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. You say, well, God hears everybody. No, he don't hear anybody who ain't praying in faith. Oh, big guy in the sky. There's a biblical way to pray. So God's word never fails. He always heals if you dare to believe him. You know, men are searching right now for everything they can to heal themselves. And they're ignoring the fact that Jehovah Rapha is within easy reach. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25 through 26, I will take sickness away from you, and the numbers of your day I will fulfill. Let me give you Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 5. It says, however, it was our sickness that he bore, our pains that he carried, yet we ourselves assumed that he'd been afflicted and struck down by God and humiliated, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We are Church that believes that it's always God's will to heal. I remember one time walking into a hospital room, and I know they were waiting on this man to die, and they wanted me to come up and pray for the man. And I was kind of confused because why are you having me come and pray for a man that you, that you are ready, you're ready for this man to die? And I'd heard they're ready, hey, they're ready to move on and, 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 uh, and, I went into the bathroom downtown in the hospital. And I remember looking myself in the mirror. I said, God, I need your help. What is your will in this situation? And I heard God's voice just as clear as I ever heard it before. He said, son, it's always my will to heal. So I walked into that hospital room. This man had been in a coma for four days. His kids were trying to talk to him. They wouldn't, he wouldn't wake up. He wouldn't move his eyes. His wife was trying to talk to him. And I knew they were just sitting there waiting for him to die. But I walked in that room. I slapped my hands on that man. And I commanded the spirit of death to leave. The man opens his eyes and begins to, oh, oh. Now, I want to tell you what happened. The person standing behind me squeezed my shoulder and I felt discernment as in they want him to die. I stopped. The man stopped. He died. My point was saying I knew what God wanted to do in that situation. But that family, do you see what I'm saying? I want you to understand this. 
I don't care where you're at, what situation you're in. Mona, we talk about this. That kid was brain dead. And they called me, come pray for that boy. How long ago was that? 10, 15 years ago. Come pray for this boy. They wanted to harvest his organs. The dad said no. Well, they called me. I don't even know who the kid is. But I remember it was in a glass room, and I told all the doctors, get out. I said, you, you've tried all your stuff. Now let me try my stuff. They don't like it, but I said it. I laid hands on that boy. I spoke over his brain, his body, and I left. And I didn't know until two years ago what happened to him. And he's alive today? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing you need to understand. You can pray for people, and you don't have to sit around and wait for the manifestation of it. He didn't have it right away. Don't investigate. <laughs> so many people investigate everything in their life to where it's a, to dilute their faith. No, just believe one report, the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. James, your daughter got the tube out this week. Did she not? She got it. Hallelujah. Hey! Got the tube out. That's a rejoicing thing right there. Yay! Wait a minute. Let's just give the Lord a dance of praise for what he did for Hazel. Come on, give me something here. We're going to get a little dance, a little praise in the house for what he's done. Here we go. Get a little dance. Give the Lord a little dance, a little praise. Oh, won't you praise him for the miracle he's going to do in your life today as well. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we thank you. You're a good God. You're an on-time God. Oh, thank you, Father. All sickness has to leave at the name of Jesus. All cancer has to go at the name of Jesus. Oh, I thank you right now, Father, that healing, the anointing is flowing in this place, flowing through the bodies of people in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Woo. All right. All right. Sit down. Sit down. We just had to give a little praise. A little praise. See, if you saw that child four months ago or however long ago it was, uh, we were in that hospital, and, and, and you guys are not praising. Oh, I tell you. See, here's the thing. Never just give God the biggest praise when it happens to you. No. Give him the same amount of praise if it's somebody else's child or somebody else's daddy or somebody else's mama. Don't be a selfish praiser. I said, don't be a selfish praiser. I said, don't be a selfish praiser. Oh, praise him in the morning. Praise him at noontime. Praise him in the evening. Hallelujah. Hey, Pastor John here. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hey, leave us a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the bell. You'll be notified every single time we drop a brand new video. Love you guys so much, but more importantly, God loves you and he is for you and not against you.